All right, I think we're almost at 110. As soon as it, the clock strikes 110, David, it looks like you're going to be talking about troposphere correction. You can start. Okay. Um, I see it's already 110, not yet. 109. Okay. So um, welcome everybody. So, so we heard already in the previous uh, few lectures talking a little bit about atmospheric noise um, or propagation delays. So generally that's compromised of two components. We have propagation delays through the uh, ionosphere, which Harish will talk um, after me about. And we also have propagation delay in the lower part of the atmosphere, which is the troposphere. Um, so, so both of them, you could try to correct for, and potentially you could use that then as input to your, let's say, modeling efforts or to uh, improve the uncertainty. So to kind of, this is this is really a short uh, summary of the, the the complete lecture. The complete lecture is actually available and was presented at last year's UNAFCO meeting, and um, the full recording you can just click on that link, and I also posted it in the in the chat uh, um, of this WebEx. Um, so feel free to. If you have more time in the evening to, to look at it completely, and I, I would be happy to answer any questions um, uh, which you might have. So um, why do we want to do a tropospheric correction for INSAR? Generally, it is for us to extract smaller magnitude signals. So here on the right-hand side, you can see an example of a long wavelength tectonic signal. It's actually pretty large. Um, it's accumulated over nine months time, and you, you see about 10 centimeters of tectonic uh, signal, and this is for the subduction zone um, where the water is here and one plate is subducting this way uh, and here you have the overriding plate. So you can see this kind of bulging effect on the inside. Now, if we compare that to the troposphere, we're really looking at easily 15 centimeters and that's in an individual interferogram. So you can already see that this signal is well hidden within the noise floor of an individual interferogram. So, and when we're talking about the troposphere, we're talking about multiple components we're generally talking about a long wavelength component, um, like what we've seen over here, a topography correlated component. So you don't know the background in this region, but um, there's a mountain ridge here, so you can see it's lower, goes up, goes back down. So there's, there's mountain, uh, a mountain ridge over here, and then there is mountains here near, uh, this is actually Mexico City where you have all the volcanoes around. So you have that topography correlated component. And then generally you have uh, turbulence in the atmosphere which is uh, high frequency noise often. So um, how do we correct for that? And, 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 and how is that really impacted in the troposphere? So the troposphere is really variations of pressure, temperature, and relative humidity, which are interacting uh, when the signal is propagating through the atmosphere, it interacts with this water vapor, and that is really what is causing this delay. So if we're, um, how this would be described is by the, uh, uh, the refractivity equation. And if we want to know what the delay really is, um, we would be integrating the refractivity along the travel path um, um, to get to a, the, the total delay. So I mean, in terms of uh, a few numbers here, um, you can see here that the uh, index is being integrated vertically with, with height. So this one over cosine is the projection from the vertical, the, the zenith as we call it, to the slant of the radar to the line of sight. And then you also have these um, scaling coefficients, um, as well as this, this factor, you might have seen this before in lectures from Paul, this four pi over lambda, that has to do with the, um, the conversion from uh, uh, displacement to phase. Um, and the minus one is it's just a sign convention. So how can we really correct for this? There's many different ways and, and methods out there. I really refer to you to go and look at the presentation online to get more details. But we can use weather models. And as you saw, that the equation before was dependent on pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. So we can directly plug those into that equation and calculate the delay. And this is, this is for a SAR delay. If you want to make an interferogram, you would then difference the two dates to get to the interferometric delay. Other methods are spectrometers. We used to have uh, MVSAT, which had Marys on board, um, which allows you to measure precipital water vapor. Now that precipital water vapor is kind of equivalent to this part here. So you can directly plug in that quantity and calculate it as well. Um, 
how these two equations relate to each other that's, that's derived in the full presentation. And then lastly, we have the phase-based method. That's where we estimate it from the data directly. And generally we apply either a linear correlation with topography or we apply some, apply some sort of power law relationship. Um, all of these methods really have their own limitations. And um, I'm going to try to illustrate it just with examples. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see the original interferogram. Uh, and then here, uh, Maris and, and Moldus are spectrometers. And we, we can estimate a correction. And generally, you can see that looks very much like that original interferogram. But you can see there are some patches here where there is no data. Now, that is the limitation of the spectrometers. They only work in daylight conditions. And they are sensitive to clouds. So you can expect when you have significant atmospheric delays, perhaps these measurements are not available. But when they are available, they do an excellent uh, job. Um, era, uh, then we go to era interim and war. Those are weather models. This is a medium resolution, let's say 70 kilometers. And war was a high resolution weather model which was run. And um, that's just to give you a feel that models remain models. So sometimes you can see that they're capturing the long wave and pretty good. Short wavelengths might be a, a hit or miss. Um, and in other cases, like this other interferogram here, you can see they're not doing a very good job in estimating a, a correction. So um, again, weather models are always available, but might have their limitations um, when they're working. And then lastly, our linear or power law, those are the phase-based methods. You estimate it from the data itself. Like I said, those are relying on the, the correlation with topography. So the linear can only estimate a single correlation over topography. Some cases, if that's, that's how the atmosphere looks like, it does a very good job. In other cases, when it, that's not the case, then it generally tends to underestimate um, the correction. Now, the power law method, that is the method which allows for spatial variability, um, tries to kind of allow for these regional changes in, in how the troposphere is working. Works in some cases very well. Again, um, doesn't capture the highest resolution. Um, also, in this example, it's doing a good job, but there are scenarios where it doesn't do a good job. So this was over Mexico. We can do the same over, over Italy. Um, you can see these are the original interferograms. Maris, there was no correction here. Probably one of the two dates or both dates had uh, clouds, so there is no correction possible. You can see MODIS has some data, but generally a significant part is missing. And when you see it's available, it, again, it does a, a pretty good job. But then if you look at the other models, like the, the weather models, they, they generally don't estimate very much of this original pretty large signal, I need to say. And then the linear method, again, and the power law, they, they estimate a correction. But in some cases, these methods can also go significantly wrong, um, like demonstrated over here. Now, and, and these are large scale examples. We can also do the same thing over a small island. Um, over an island, you can see most of these methods are performing similarly. There is not that much spatial variation in the atmosphere. So a correlation with topography, which you can see in the linear and the power law, gives you a similar result as the weather model. So this island is about 30 kilometers in size. Weather model was 70 kilometers. Warp was something like uh, 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 9 or 10, I believe. So you can see all of them are doing a similar result. And the Marys and the Modus, too much cloud cover. It's an island, generally um, uh, not available. Um, so coming to kind of the conclusion uh, from this is that all these metrics have their own limitations. They might be performing uh, well in certain um, instances and, and worse at other times. So all, all of them have their, um, um, so all, all of them depend really on the, on the region of interest and uh, the time of day really. So the other thing which we notice is that with increasing cloud cover, we generally see that these methods go worse. And there are some figures in the, in, the, in the full presentation to kind of explain that. And a key takeaway message which we're trying to do is that um, none of them is exclusively the best. You might need to kind of combine um, uh, the best uh, features from all these different methods. For that, you really need to understand the uncertainties, which is not very straightforward. Um, but still, that is probably where the community is going towards uh, in the future. Um, there's different packages out there which you can use to correct your tropospheric delays, um, train, IPS3, um, as well as the Geico service. And here you just provide a bounding box and you can go and download the product. Um, so I, um, like I said, I, I really recommend you to go and look at the full presentation to get uh, additional um, information. And feel free
free to ask me any question um, in the chat or, or email me.